Oh, wow. life of an architect right there. It's just like a uh, seventh inning stretch. That's what that was. I, see, look, look at me with the sports with the sports reference. Ooh, you're sportsing. I'm sportsing <laughs> right now. Yeah, I am. I have a glass of wine and I'm sportsing. Exactly. Go yeah, that's why I'm team. sportsing. Yeah, do the thing. Win the points. Yeah. Go sports. S- score the basket. Thing. <laughs> kick the ba- kick kick the ball into the basket. Yes. <laughs> do it. <laughs> uh so yeah, it's just been one of those. It was uh what was interesting is it was the a week of I went away to take my son up to college and right, right. prepared everything up until to get to like being able to walk away because I was conveniently or inconveniently, however you want to look at it, going to be away from my desk when we were submitting for a deadline. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's always and perfect time. <laughs> what could go wrong? Everything. Yeah. We'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Don't want to yeah. give away the punchline yet. Exactly. Well, yeah. so I leave and the, I mean, I guess you could call it unforeseen, but it's always seen, right? You know, you always <laughs> assume that something's going to happen. And yes, yeah. it did because. Right. Of course. We're, we're provided by this particular owner a list of comments, review comments that they've had. And then they give you kind of like this level of acceptance or rejected and, you know, you, whatever. Revise and, and so, resubmit. Revise and resubmit. And so this was, I hate to say it, this was a resubmittal. And so we were, that was all prepared, ready to kind of go. And But, you know, my responsibility in making sure that all of the comments were not only answered, but yeah. then also also sent, addressed. you know, addressed and QC it and make sure that we've got everything in there. So the document itself, very, very important document. <laughs> yeah. You're just like, you're, I, now I remember the, the text messages. Yeah. That were, so yeah. then, okay. <laughs> yeah. So then I get a couple, so I did get one of apparently a whole lot of frantic text calls and emails, which apparently something was up with my phone because I only got, I got one and I did mute that one because I was in the middle of something and I couldn't take the call. Yeah. Um, so if somehow, some way I conveniently or inconveniently, I'm going to go with conveniently, um, <laughs> screwed up something on my phone. Mute. Um, it, it might have, you know, one of the things that I didn't even check is did I accidentally put it in like airplane mode or something instead of. I think when I was, I could have, you know, I could have when I was uh, turning it to whatever, I could have put it to airplane mode, but. It but doesn't I, matter. I did, You're not your desk I, anyway. I, did, I, mean, I you, didn't. The so messages would still come in at some point, even if you did put it in airplane they, mode. They, so some, something went wrong. Yeah, something went wrong. And what happened was, is that they're like, hey, Cormac, we're looking for these comments, but the the file that we have Nothing, there is nothing there. There's, there's comments, but there's no responses. I'm like, no, that's wrong. We, we, we were with me. I, we, you know, we went through a handful of them and they're like, no, no, yeah. no, they're gone. No, they're not. So I finally get back. <laughs> and in denial. They, they, they well, can't be gone. <laughs> so get back Monday morning, open things up, realize, yeah, they're gone. And then I'm like, click, 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 clicking through because there's, it's an Excel file and there's a whole bunch of other tabs, you know, architecture, interiors, pool, blah, 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 all the way through. And so I start clicking through all of the other ones. Now, my file only had responses for architecture. There was no other responses. We got the, the other responses would come in and we would merge the two files. Guess what happened? Overwrite. Overwrite. Not merge. Overwrite. I, I was, you know, you, one hundred and I'm pissed about this. <laughs> one hundred and sixty comments that took me weeks to do, gone. Yeah, I mean, and that's why you were took your glasses off. <laughs> that's why I took exactly. You do, do the seventh inning stretch with your face. Yeah, 
because, and, and my question is, how the beep does this happen in today's <laughs> world? <laughs> and yes. it's what's crazy, Cormac, is like, I can say that, like, what, how in the world can this happen? And yet so many firms still work this way. Oh, I'll email you a copy and I'll email you a copy and I'll email you a copy and we'll merge all the files in the end. And inadvertently, I mean, nobody plans this in advance, but right. but this overwrite thing should not happen today, yeah. ever, ever. It's, you know it's, why? I was pissed when you told me <laughs> that this happened. And, and do you know why it shouldn't happen even today on this particular occurrence? Because what I did was I sent everybody a Teams link. To the shared document oh. that everybody could work in. But what happened? Somebody most likely downloaded, downloaded it. this to my machine. Exactly. Did their thing. Everybody got all of their stuff. And instead of dis distributing the actual link and let everybody work on it, and I, I don't care how many people work on it. Just get in there, do your thing, have fun. Guess what? We would have a total document. <clears throat> and even, even if we get the document back rather than overwriting it, why not just go ahead and merge it? There, there is a, a tool within oh, Excel that you can compare and merge two documents that are the same, but have different things. Similar, but not different. to say that, yeah, uh, yeah right. I, I don't, I don't. I'm, I I don't want to sound like I'm condoning the idiocy that happened, but there are ways around the idiocy if you're going to go down the path of idiocy. My goodness. Okay, and, before we go on, before we go on, I okay. just want to, like, because we're still under the 10-minute mark here, <laughs> I want to let people know that we're going to talk about architecture here in a minute. So so don't stop listening. I, I want to talk about your trip that you mm. just went on. But yeah. before we, be, so, so before we continue, <laughs> I just want to let people know that because the whole episode isn't going to be about this, right? Oh, no, and, no, no, and, no. and I think it's important in the first 10 minutes to, because what, something I've noticed, Cormac, is um, people stop listening precipitously after about the 12 minute mark. So there's our attention span in architecture okay. land. It's about 12 <laughs> minutes. So we're going to do something right now to advocate for listening longer in this episode to a, a really cool architectural field trip that Cormac went on. Okay. Yes. But I, I just wanted to do a little intermission there and, and, and let people know that was coming so that you can continue this, this mind blowing, mind bending rant that is appropriate. But, but I will say, <laughs> exactly. I will say. And I would like to actually put this behind me and, and not think about it anymore. So, you know, we could move on to the thing. But I will say that you know, this is the kind of things, these are the kind of things that you have the discussions about during your, you know, when you're project managing something, when you're putting together your workflow, when you're work, you know, assigning tasks, that you know, these are the kind of things that you just have to look out for. You know, make, make sure you're not doing something silly like, you know, oh yeah, by the way, you set up something that everybody can get into it and use it at the same time, a la going through Teams in this particular case. And, but I'm going to go ahead and download it. So when I download it, maybe somebody should tell somebody in advance that, hey, I'm about to copy over all of your work. Mm -hmm. Just to let mm -hmm. you know, I know that you've been no. doing this for about two, three weeks maybe you might want to know that you should save it onto your desktop. So, and of course, everybody's like accusing me. So, well, why did you save, save it on your desktop? Yeah. Why didn't you do the thing that I, we're all guilty, that I'm guilty of doing? Yeah. I'm like, ah, 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 yeah. yeah, no, you did it right. And, and that, that's yeah. what makes me angry about this is that <laughs> you got your work done early. Yeah. And yeah, you get yeah. penalized for getting your work done <laughs> early because your shit's gone. Like it got exactly. overwritten. That's crazy, right? And and it, it yeah. is it mind boggling to me that people think email is a file system. It is not oh, a know. file system. Yeah. Stop emailing yourself files. Find a better <laughs> way. Like wise up. Get uh, yeah. smart. Like yeah. how people still do this. And yes. it's not e okay, first of all, email is not private at all. Email is an open 
completely unsecure system. Mm -hmm. Anything mm -hmm. that you email to somebody else could be just lifted out of the digital airwaves. It is it not should be secure just in because. any way. <laughs> just because you're doing it. It was just, just like, you know, just, just because you did this. Here, yeah. exactly. Take this. I mean, and if and if your client knew that that stuff was just going out over email, it would be like, what? What are you talking about? And and I'm sure they're guilty of it too. But it's oh, yeah. Yeah. it's it's important oh, to yeah. say these things that that certain people know. Not everybody knows. People can't be punished for not knowing what they don't know. But right. it's at the same time, like it is the the technology teams. Uh, imperative that they convey this information over and over and over and over and over again because there is turnover there's new people showing up all the time there's people with really bad habits there's people who like to do it the way they've always done it and it turns out that there are better ways to yeah. do things yeah and it's it's it it's got it like how heartbreaking for you to come back after a, a vacation and have to do yeah. the same thing over again for right. for multiple days and try to reconstruct what you already took care of like that that do three and, and the do project three weeks just takes of, the burden you know? yeah do three weeks worth of work in a day and a half yeah because I did spend um, at least a half a day trying to like scour Recover like my temp in in to be fair to whoever you know sabotaged me um, I did I did recover about one third of the comments. And so I j only had to go through two thirds of recreation of, you know, some very complex comments and stuff like that. And then go through the documents and say, okay, where does, you know, where is my responses and the changes reside? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, that was just a, it was, it was something special. It, it was, was something, something special. special. All right. So I'm, <laughs> I'm glad that we had that therapy session. You can now move beyond this. Deep breath, let it in, let it out. Man. Yeah. All right. So you did get to do a very cool field trip. I got I to do super some jealous. very cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So when we, so on a couple of different occasions, uh, when I've taken my son up to school, now where we live is in the Detroit metro area, and then we drive up to the I upper peninsula. I t-shirt. I can see where you live. Detroit? Yeah. And this is just <laughs> like when I get lost- they say, mm. where are you from? Yeah, me too. This is my, you know, my I, exactly. when I get lost shirt. Is, is that step so, back into the, into the hedge. In, from the <laughs> abyss, you're, you live in the abyss. The yeah. darkness. Just like that Homer Simpson, you know, <laughs> exactly back into the, the hedge. That's me. Except for your, you've got to, yours has got to be very, at, at night. It's a black hedge, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the the black blackthorn hedges. So this is what you wear okay. when you get lost, and people. This is what I wear back. when I get lost. Yeah, exactly. So we take like on occasion. In fact, even when you know about what is it? I guess now uh, two AIA conventions ago, I had taken my son uh, up to school, and then I came down and met you at the AIA convention. And every time right. I drive past. I'm driving through Wisconsin to get from there to down to uh, Chicago. You drive through um, Wisconsin. Beautiful. You drive through the back roads and all this other stuff. Beautiful things. But you pass these signs and, you know, there's there's tons of signs all over the place. Tizing the Frank Lloyd Wright Trail. It's like when you're in the East Coast and it's like George Washington slept here. <laughs> so, okay. So, I also, well, <laughs> Just to kind of also set the stage, you know, I was listening to an audio book from, was it Ada Louise uh, Huxley or Huxtable? Mm. Huxtable, um, Huxtable, yes. That, uh, the Frank Lloyd Wright biography. Oh, nice. And just, <laughs> it, I'll leave my comments of like, you know, well, it, it doesn't paint a, like a, a rosy picture of how kind and nice oh, he I'm is. Oh, sure. Is, um, it a, is it worth listening to though? I mean, oh, can you make oh, a recommendation? Absolutely. Yes, okay. I do. I would. Because it does actually teach you a lot. It it teaches a lot, teaches a lot about somebody who in a somewhat self, he, I mean, he did it to himself, but somebody who had so many different rebirths of, you know, count him out. Nope. He got back up. You know, knock him back down. Nope. He got back up. Knock him back down. Nope. He got back up. You know, wow. And yeah. it, it, 
was amazing. And there were some things that, you know, obviously were beyond his control. And I'm sure if anybody who knows the story, you know, knows, you know, some of his own personal family tragedy that, I mean, they could, you know, they would wreck somebody. And mm-hmm. to be able to get back up, it's, you know, pretty, pretty impressive. And I don't know how your school and your education kind of treated the, you know, teaching that portion of architectural history on how, like, we had people who came in teaching a very opinionated, like, take on what they thought about Frank Lloyd Wright. And so, Mm. you know, a lot of times that would rub off on my education or just like, ah, you know, Frank Lloyd wrong, or, you know, it's just like, hey, you're becoming an architect. Do you want to be the next Frank Lloyd Wright? Like, no, I don't want to be the next Frank Lloyd Wright. I want to be, and it's just like, but the more and more you go and you visit his work, whether or not, you know, you look at it through the lens of like a project manager that says, well, of course that was going to leak. Cause you know, look at the details, forget that, put all of that aside. Right. Oh my Lord. Oh my Lord. I mean, the, the dude, he knew what he was doing for somebody <laughs> listening to this book who did not complete architecture school. And, you know, started and then basically had the stance that, what can they teach me about architecture? I don't need to know any of this for what I want to do in architecture. So I am going to quit school. And he did. And, you know, for somebody who had quit school with a very, very short period of architecture training within the academic profession, to be able to do what he did, pretty damned amazing. Um, yeah, it was something like over 500 projects, right? It was like that actually yeah. got built. Is that the right yeah. number? I don't know for sure. Historian. It was it was an insane amount and, you know, of the ones that got built and of the ones that still exist. There's a lot of really good, if, you know, people are on Facebook, There's a, there really is a really good bunch of different groups that are kind of dedicated to uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. There's one that I belong to called The Right Attitude, which kind of funny but it's it's curated by a bunch of docents who work at a lot of the different frank lloyd wright houses and have are just a complete wealth of knowledge you know they've studied at, as a taliesin fellow and you know really are you know carrying on this tradition yeah but before we kind of get into like you know what i saw in in experience and things like that I know. One I love things, it. I love how you're building up like the suspense here because we don't even know where you visited yet, but this right. is, this is good. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I found really amazing. And so this is one of the questions that I wanted to ask you. So, you know, we have all of these star architects, you know, Zaha and, you know, uh, Gary and Morphosis and all of these people, but are they really? And the reason I want to ask, are they really? When there's a project In a town, like say there's the, you know, in Milwaukee, there's um, the addition to the Milwaukee Museum of Art uh, by Caltrava, right? And that building doesn't have like for miles and miles before you get into Milwaukee and miles and miles on the other side of Milwaukee, signs telling you that there are buildings from that architect in that town. But there are, if you're Frank, if you're Frank Lloyd well, Wright. it's not a fair comparison. He's long gone. There's, there's a foundation. There's all these things that there's these groups, there's yeah. these Facebook groups. Like I, to, to, to be a little bit fair, like I'm driving down <laughs> I-5 from Oregon to California. There is a yeah. sign for the Sundial Bridge. It doesn't okay. say Calatrava on it, but it does say the mm-hmm. Sundial Bridge is this way. It's like, like everybody knows what that is. I, but, uh, so, but. <laughs> But regardless of that, they, they, they basically say Frank Lloyd Wright buildings, exit, blah, blah, blah. They don't say like, you know, well, some of them say wing spread or, you know, things like that. You know, some will say that, but. A little foreshadowing right there. Exactly. But there are, (laughs) but I mean, it's just, they're down in, it, it says down in Florida at the Florida Southern campus that he designed. Uh, as you're going into Lakeland, it does say the Frank Lloyd Wright 
Florida Southern campus buildings. I, I can't remember. It's been a while You're since I've seen this. say. Yeah. But, you know, there are signs that basically say, hey, there's a Frank Lloyd Wright building over there. You want to go check it out? You know, get off the get off the interstate here and, and go this way. And then that's they just like, right? Because that's not a, you, there's no tour there, I assume. No, no, there's not. Yeah, it's just like a campus no. you could walk around. I could totally but, understand that for buildings that you can take tours of because the foundation probably pays for those signs that then right. leads to ticket sales for tours. And it, yeah. it makes sense. Um, I mean, just to your point, though, about like the the docents who run these Facebook groups and the the level of expertise and knowledge that they have. When I was at Taliesin West, I mean, there was an architect leading that tour who had also graduated from that school. And mm. the 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 depth of knowledge and how far back that goes is absolutely incredible. And oh, yeah, like that is one of the things that really sets these kinds of tours apart, whether it's you know, Talies and West or the, you know, if you're, if you're in LA and you go to the Hollyhock house, or if you're, I'm sure there's, you know, the Guggenheim and there's all right. these places that have that level of sophistication of mm -hmm. attracting talent to lead these tours, to then proliferate yeah. these stories, which also right. helps kind of reinforce like the, the, the architecture that people get to experience when they're on those tours. So let me go one step further. So this is where my story of my tours begin. So as we're driving down. That was plural, uh, people. Just listen. Yeah. Yes. So as, as we're driving down, we're you know, probably about, say, 30 miles or so um, north of Milwaukee. And we were going to stay in the Milwaukee area, uh, kind of a... A somber anniversary for my wife and her father had grown up in the area. And so we were going to stay there for, you know, reasons. And so we had already known that we were going to be there. And that day, you know, we were going to kind of like hang out in uh, Milwaukee and cut a hay and then basically just kind of like drive along the Wisconsin uh, coastline of Mi Lake Michigan and, you know, just kind of explore. So other than two tours that I had signed up for in advance because you had to, everything else was unplanned, which is very typical of us. It's just like, let's, let's explore. And as long as you've got a very willing navigator, which thankfully I do, <laughs> That's awesome. then you're going to find something and it's going to be really kind of fun and cool. So, you know, I was just like, Hey, you know, we're going to be going on these tours tomorrow. You want to see if there's anything Frank Lloyd Wright in in Milwaukee, because I don't know, I, I don't know the extent of, you know, buildings within Wisconsin, other than the buildings that they advertise across the Frank Lloyd Wright trail. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, she's like, well, yeah, there's a, there's a house. Um, it's about 15 minutes away. Well, let's go see it. It's just, what, what did people do before, before smartphones? I, that's that, that, true. It's just that, incredible. I, you're right. I mean, that, you would have had good, to figure this out. I would have had to have figured this out. I would have, I would have had to have known it was there and then map it out because there's On another Map story Quest or a Thomas guide or yeah. Or even before that, when it was, you know, like oh, in right. the late nineties, when you didn't have map quests and you needed to just say, okay, there's a building like say for instance, uh, the Rosenbaum house, which is in Florence, Alabama, only building that he did in the state of Alabama. And I, you know, had to like go on, you know, pull out the old paper map and then just look at where is Florence and how do you get to Florence? And then once yeah, you get to highlighter. Florence, try to figure out where it is once you get there, because it may not have had a sign. I think it did yeah. actually have a sign though. Even back then. This gets back <laughs> into like asking for directions from a southerner. Ex oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, which some people mistook that that was something that I was criticizing and I really wasn't. I mean, there is a beauty in an art to the way that, yeah. you know, that directions are given. You know, Somebody they, uh, left a comment on our YouTube video. It said, turn left where the old oak tree used to be. Exactly. Exactly. Well, somebody else said, you know, somebody else had criticized, you know, it's just like, you ever listen to your northerner give uh, directions? I'm like, I mean, fair enough. Fair enough. Right. You know, so, okay. So 15 minutes away. 
So we go. And it's a Joseph Molina house is what it was built for. And so we're driving there and it takes us into this really like uh, North Milwaukee suburb, all filled with ranchers, you know, like larger like ranch houses and stuff. And, in, and we're driving through this windy neighborhood and, you know, we, there's like, no, it's not there. And then Siri's like, you know, your destination is on the left. And then, you know, we, it, it was one house off of where it was, but it was, we didn't quite crest the corner where we actually saw the house. And so it was just like, no, it's not, this is just a ranch. And so we are like, okay, um, maybe they had it wrong. You know, we started to drive. There's some people out uh, for their evening walk. And so, you know, we were just, you know, just kind of like slowly driving past them. And then I saw the corner of the house. I'm like, oh, there it is. And so, of course, we like stop and we see the corner of the house. You can see, like, you know, this. Get out of the car. You have to take this in one step at a time. Well, no. So, so we actually, you know, because there were people walking around, I wasn't going to get out and, you know, start walking around. But I, I pulled up. To then, you know, because it was an L-shaped house. L-shaped house. So I'm going to, yeah, whatever. L-shaped house. Hold, hold and it right there. Exactly. The local. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that what that means? Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I, I pull up and I kind of like pull off to the side of the, the road just to let, you know, kind of like people walk by. And I'm sitting there and I'm staring at the house. And of course, I roll the window down so that I don't have like little bug, you know, in the way of me taking pictures and stuff. You don't want your camera and, focusing on the glass. I mean, everybody oh, exactly. does an amateur exactly. move right there. Yeah. Well, we'll post some pictures to my Instagram post of uh, the amateur move of um, some pictures through glass. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> some, for, for, some foreshadowing there, too. Right. right so, okay. okay. So, so uh, we're out there, trucks idling, well, People are like walking by and they're like, oh, more people staring at this house. And like, you know, <laughs> it's got, you just, the people are programmed, right? To just, just assume, oh, there's going to be people stop. So like, because everywhere we stopped and there was a, a, f- a few places all the way down to our final destination of tours that we had stopped, you know, multiple times and did the drive by. And, you know, people were like looking at us like, oh, no, no, another one. And so, then there was a couple, an older couple, who had, rather than walking by, walked up to the truck. And of course, you know, I do this whole, I always have this kind of, this, this spiel that I give is just like, don't mind me, I'm just a, an architecture nerd, you know, taking pictures of this beautiful house. You know, I just wanted to make it sound like I was not threatening or, or creepy or boy. weird and yeah. you know, or a fanboy or all this other stuff. And they're like, oh, well, that's our house. You know, of course... Jogger. You're like, yeah, you're no, you're, you're like, like uh, 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 okay, this could go two ways either it you're a creeper, very much good, or yeah. yeah, they're gonna let you. And what was amazing about it is they were very accommodating, and so they were, they were at first, they were like, oh, were you on the the other week or you know, like last month? And I'm like, no, no, we're you know, we're we're just driving through, and, and I kind of give them the story of this, like, you know, we decided drive through Wisconsin on the long way home to Detroit. And they're like, they kind of like looked at us like, that was weird. And then she was like, oh, I used to work in Detroit. Hopefully it's getting better. And I was like, well, what was the last time you were there? And she's like, 1974. Like, it's changed a bit. It's a little different. It has changed a bit because like, that was a year before our family left Michigan and moved to Florida. So it was, so we started to chat and, she proudly proclaimed, um, she's like, oh, um, my husband. And she kind of like points at, um, so it was Nick and Sylvia. I got a chance to to talk to him a little bit. And so, you know, Sylvia points to to Nick and she was just like, you know, his, uh, his grandfather was an architect. And he like looks at me, he's like, um, have you ever heard of uh, Bertram Goodhue? And the name didn't immediately ring a bell. But he was just like, he was the architect on the Nebraska State House. Boom. That I know. I know that project. Okay. That's kind of a pretty amazing project because that actually was. So Paul Cret, and I never really know if I'm actually pronouncing his last name, it's, you know, C-R-E-T, you know, so I'm pronouncing it the way that I, you know, but anyway. The way you read it. Yep. The way that I read it. 
And so has in in where I finally realized Bertram Goodhue was is that he attrib Paul Cret attributes a lot of his design sensibilities and stuff to Bertram Goodhue because Bertram Goodhue was kind of a just slightly before Paul Cret was, but was doing some of the same work and was kind of they were both, you know, kind of attributed as as pioneers of introducing American architecture to Art Deco. Mm. And so if you kind of like do a little bit of research, I mean, Goodhue passed away early. He was pretty young. He was 40. Um, but uh, actually a decent amount of work actually out in Los Angeles, all over the place. And it was, it was a, it was pretty amazing breadth of work for a pretty short career. So we started talking a little bit about that and, and we just were kind of like chatting and it was like, tell me a little bit about the house and you know, that it was one of, um, I believe, well, it was. It was one of three models that um, was called the Ur Erdem prototype. I believe it's a prototype, but they basically, there was a builder that Frank Lloyd Wright at the very end of his career had worked with because he had always wanted to have the Usonian houses become basically a prefab house mm -hmm. and never got a chance to, to really have that take off. And so at the very end of his career. He, you know, was working with a developer and developed three different house types and only two different types of were built. And this was one of them. And there was a handful of them, you know, in, in the area. And so, you know, we, we just started talking and then, then she kept urging him. She's like, well, you know, go and get, you know, um, you know, go and get a card. And, you know, next time you guys are in town, why don't you, uh, let us know in advance and, you know. We'd love to, you know, we'd love to show just, you around. Just call me. And, and so he rushes in and, you know, comes back and she's leaning on the truck and, you know, we're, we're sitting there and we're talking and she's just kind of get, you know, getting to know us and get comfortable with us. And why are you people like skulking outside of our house kind of thing? And then, you know, he comes back and he hands me the card and then she looks at Nick and she's just like, let's just. And, and then she like looks at us and she's like, you know, since you came all this way, why don't you just come on in? And I'm like, oh, oh, okay. You didn't even have to use the, uh, the, uh, don't you know who I am statement. Yeah, exactly. Uh, as one of the co-hosts of exactly. our to speak podcast. Exactly. So, so I look over at my wife and, <laughs> and she's just like, oh, we, you know, like both of us were like, we don't really want to, I mean, like you've been gracious enough just like standing out here and telling us the story of the house and everything else. But. I don't want to bother you in your home. I mean, you're not expecting right. guests and visitors or anything like that. And so, you know, we were if just you like, have well, a house we, like we, that though, Cormac, like at some level, you just have to always keep it picked up. Like there's no well, actual living in a Frank Lloyd Wright house. I, <laughs> I have to imagine. So, so with, yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll finish that thought of yours. Um, okay. so, you know, I look over at my wife and I'm just like, do, do we go in? And, and she's just like, you're looking for she, some, some backup. It was, yeah. Well, it was just like, you know, I was looking at her like, you know, hell yeah, this is an opportunity for us to do it. Let's, you know, let's do it. And she's just like, I don't really want to intrude on them. And they're just like, no, 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 no. You came all this way. You know, I mean, you know, why not, you know, like, come on in. So we're like, all right. So we pull if into their, exist. exactly. So one thing that I did learn that. These prototype houses, Frig Lloyd Wright, as we all may or may not know, but we are going to know now, hated garages, period. Mm. Hated garages. Mm. Everything was- A place to store your crap. Exactly. He, well, I mean, he hated like storage and unnecessary rooms or bedrooms that were oversized to like carry anything more than you sleeping in it because mm. that was kind of like, you know, the intent of the room was, oh, it's a bedroom. There's a bed. Mm -hmm. there's a room with a bed and then yeah. you spend very little time in there. You spend doing just what you need to do and then go back out into the community spaces, which was very much even this, you know, this aspect too. But so we go in and they go, they th go through the garage, you know, we go through the front door and, and even though it's a, a prototype house or a prefab house, it very much feels like, his typical Usonian house, um, there's nothing that really screams anything until you go inside. 
and it's bigger. It feels vertically bigger than any of the houses that I've ever been in of Frank Lloyd Wright's because there was the compression yeah. right as you, right at the front door, there's like the, a compression, there's a soffit that you know kind of like pulls you down. But then right as you get out of that, the kind of like entry area, it opens up and it's a, not a very high pitched roof, but it's still like, you know, pitched ceiling, vaulted ceiling. And, and it just feels far more voluminous than any of the buildings that I've, any of the, the small single story houses that I've ever been in. Okay. And, and so and what's we the like, main material that this place is made out of. So it was kind of intended to be a, you know, it was still intended to have local materials as like, you know, the siding and all of this other stuff. So, but it was a combination of both wood and stone and the stone was actually carried into the house. And so there was areas and the kind of like the traditional horizontal, like board and batten type siding, like on the interior, that was mm-hmm. very much it, you know, with kind of like this uh, triangular batten that, you know, kind of like set like horizontal, like it was like every 12 inches, kind of this very horizontal kind of line work through there, but it worked beautifully with the stonework. So it was just as taliesin ish in that regard. Yeah. I mean, how, how many, um, Usonian houses have you been in? None. Cause, cause I've, I've never, unfortunately I've never been in taliesin. Oh, well, Uh, I mean, but I've been in the textile block, but that's different than Usonian, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so Usonian. Okay. So Usonian, Because he uses basically wood interior, you know, like wood paneling on the interior, you know, wood siding on the exterior, and it kind of like translates on the inside and outside. There's like these like batten, you know, horizontal battens. Mm -hmm. And, and so, and we'll, we'll post photographs in the show notes or, or link to my uh, Instagram page, which I've been copiously posting a lot of, you know, about the, uh, the trip that I took and. You can even look and see some of my affinity for lighthouses because I saw a lot of them, hmm. a lot. I think on this, this just this past weekend, and the weekend was literally three days long um, because Sunday was basically just drive back to the Detroit and, and hmm. not really stop anywhere or anything like that. But Thursday, Saturday, or Thursday, yeah, because Saturday comes after Thursday. Yeah. Thursday, Friday, Saturday was all purely just like, you know, taking the kid up there. He would, he literally unpacked the, the truck and moved into his room within five minutes because he had, everything was in bags and he basically wow. just took everything out of the bag and dumped it into like dumps. He's a pro. Oh nice. yeah. He's a pro. He's a pro. Going back to a previous episode where we, you know, I you know, was teaching kids how to pack. He, uh, he also has mastered the unpacking. Um, <laughs> Dump. So He's exactly, dump. dump. Yeah, dump. He open, open drawer, dump in. There you go. That was his unpack. So here we are. We're in this house, and, we're, and they're giving us this tour. And so where I was kind of like fast forwarding, or kind of like telling you about how I was going to finish your thought about the the docents and the wealth of knowledge that they bring. What I found amazing was that owners, and this isn't the only owner that I've met. I actually met an owner that was the original owner that actually worked with and hired Frank Lloyd Wright. That was a wealth of, it was the Rosenbaum house in, in Florence, Alabama. So here, this is, this is probably maybe, I don't know, third, fourth, possibly, you know, third or fourth owner of the house. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if like, as you pass on the house, the library of Frank Lloyd Wright houses or the you know, library of documentation of the house or things kind of like go, you know, gets passed on to the next owner. Yeah. But every, to. every owner mm-hmm. is such a steward of the house of Frank Lloyd Wright. I mean, there's, there literally is a Frank Lloyd Wright owners yeah. association. Yeah. And they carry on the knowledge. They, are telling the story as if they were the original owners of how that, how the first owner, you know, had commissioned the house, how that builder had worked with Frank Lloyd Wright to develop these houses. I mean, 
they carried on the story and it was, it was really, really amazing that you, you just, you, you become the, you become the next historian of that house. Yeah. And the steward. Yeah, exactly. And, and it was, it was really kind of amazing. And, and they did not have to invite us into this, into their house, but right. we were there for two hours. It was That's amazing. Awesome. Like, you know, if I probably kept talking because they wanted to keep talking and I wanted to keep hearing their stories, but I felt so bad that we were imposing on them that we were trying to pull a, you know, a, a you know, a Michigan exit or, you know, Midwestern exit or however it is right. like, okay, you know, it's like, all right, well, you know, time to go, you know, kind of thing. It was just like <laughs> trying to like, and they wanted in the, then the thing was, so after we got this great tour and learned a lot about the house and it, it beautifully set in, the, the backyard kind of like falls off. And so there's a basement area and that basement area kind of terraces down into the landscape. And then there's an upper terrace and it's just this, it's the landscape, the, the, it's everything that I wish that I could do to a house that I, of course, you know, either a can never afford to do or just don't have the property or the right house to do it. In. But I mean, like the way that it just captures the landscape was just amazing. I mean, this was a suburban house in a sea of ranchers and nobody had that type of setting for both their house and their landscape. It was just like everybody's was very kind of like vanilla suburbia kind of landscape. And then here you go, this kind of like, you know, star of the show. It was, yeah. you know, it was completely amazing. I've had that so experience as, a couple of times with uh, Schindler houses, like where... Wow. Oh, when I was a nice. student, I, you know, one of my professors in second year was a Schindler aficionado. She'd written <laughs> books about him and she's, she's at U of O now, University of Oregon. So, um, Judith Shine, but she, I'm like, can you get me into th these houses <laughs> that we visited when I was a student? Can I go <laughs> back? And so, I mean, it was like 2008 at this point, it was like it, quite a while ago, but I, I called her up and I said, hey, is there any way I can get into a couple of Schindler houses in L.A.? <laughs> and she put me in direct touch with the owners. So it wasn't oh. quite as serendipitous as your, <laughs> you know, pulling but up still. on the curb but, and they just happen exactly. to be walking by. But yeah. getting to know the owner of the Tischler house and the Kalis house, who actually like, commissioned Rudolf Schindler to design and those houses with mm -hmm. their, their needs, their input, their family size. Like, I mean, and just, they've always lived there their whole life. Like that was their place. Yeah. The, the stories, the insight is just, wow. it's absolutely yeah. incredible. And those are the stories that, uh, that, you know, really do kind of need to be told because those are, to me, you know, you can look at a building, you know, from, you know, like an academic point of view. And it, it's fine. You know, you, you get to understand the building, but, but you when you get to understand, so yeah. exactly. I mean, but yeah, when you get to like surface. have the conversation. So like when I, you know, was at the Rosenbaum house. So we, this was sort of before we actually, we were planning on doing a tour in architecture school, but this was like, you know, a semester or so away. And I was driving back and forth to Northern Alabama because that was where my um, National Guard unit was. And so I was like, well, if I'm going to keep driving up here, I, I'm just going to go and drive, uh, you know, I'm going to keep driving like two extra hours and I'm going to go and, you know, find this house. And I do. And so I'm sitting across the street because again, you know, it's one of these things, can I like go up and knock on somebody's door and, you know, Hey, I, I hear you got a, you know, a, uh, Frank Lloyd right here. Tell me about it kind of thing. No, now I, not even remotely in my DNA to do, to like <laughs> intrude on somebody like that. Right. And so, but I am sitting on the curb across the street, kind of a catty corner to the house and I'm sketching it. And, you know, Mildred Rosenbaum was, uh, you know, when she was still with us and still living there, um, she <laughs> come, I, I guess she was probably like, you know, you know, I think she was taking the garbage out or getting ready to take the garbage out. Cause fast forward, I took the garbage out for her. Um, <laughs> uh, 
she she saw me and she was like, "Hey, you, come here, stalker." <laughs> and it was just like, "Okay, little old lady tells you to come here, you come you here." You do it, yeah, exactly. Right. And so I walk across the street, and she's like, "Are you an architect?" I'm like, "Well, I'm an architecture student," and I was actually in uniform, which was funny, is because I was like, you know, just um, I was I, I think it was. I don't know. I always like drove in uniform when I was up there because like I didn't bring a change of clothes. I was going to do my, you know, and then drive back. And it also, it also helped me get out of a Look couple of speeding tickets. I'm sure. Yeah. Look how practical you are. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was more about the speeding tickets really. Cause I got pulled yeah. over for doing some excessive speeds and they were like, well, you know, since you're a soldier, we'll knock it down to you were only doing 85 instead of 135. <laughs> Seriously. That I, seriously, that was that I, I, it was a, it was a, you were about to go to jail or we're going to knock it down to, you were just barely speeding. We're still going to give you a ticket, but we're not going to haul you off to jail kind of situation. So, wow. yeah. So I did sort of like, you know, wear my uniform often. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So, you know, she goes in and she, you know, brings me in and tell, you know, and tells me all of these different stories and stuff. And, you know, much like yours, there is nothing that will exchange nothing in an academic textbook that is going to exchange the stories that you hear from the owner's perspective, especially the owners who commission these architects to do it. Yeah. And so, you know, like your stories with the Schindler's uh, houses and, you know, these right houses that I, you know, got, have had a chance to meet at least two of the owners of that, you know, he just current like, the owners, wealth, yeah. you know, yeah, it's incredible. Or, or original owner, but with the Rosenbaum yeah. house, it was the original right. owner. Right. Um, so, so it was just like it could complete, you know, amazement that we were, you know, got a chance to do that. So then, you know, next day we, you know, okay, now it's time to like, you know, um, we got a hotel room and actually I swear that they might've been on the verge, but you know, it's just like, well, um, you know, we got to go, we've got to go find a hotel room. They might've actually been on the verge of like, you know, putting us up for the night, but I didn't want to push my luck because he had made a comment. He was just like, well, this is, you know, you know, normally if we know people are coming, this is where we put our guests. And he showed me like, you know, the guest room and amazing. Like, you know, it was like, it was huge room too. And like, like seriously, this was the most uncommon Frank Lloyd Wright house because it was so, it was big in comparison to a lot of the houses that I've been in from his, even one of the other um, houses that I'm about to tell you about. And this was a, a mansion and yeah, it was yeah. still small. Mm -hmm. um, so I do have to tell you a non Frank Lloyd Wright house that we stopped by is as we were like driving by and um, there was um, I, I'm Rick's laughing house. already because yeah. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen this, the photos. So, so Rick's house, um, there was this house right on uh, that kind of overlooked the park that, you know, was uh, there was, this amazing kind of like park system that they have right along, you know, between, you know, on, in Milwaukee and Cudahy that, uh, are that front, um, Lake Michigan. And so his, his house was, you know, on Lakeshore drive and we, you know, I'm, I'm driving past it and I kind of like glance out of the corner and I'm like, you, you can't miss it. I'm like, what the? And so I like, yeah. you know, did like, you know, did like multiple, like, you know, DC turns in the middle of the road and, and, you know, kind of got back there and I kind of pulled up, you know, alongside the house. And, and he expects everybody to do this mm -hmm. because you pull up and it is an art project. It is a 40 year long art project. Um, he said that he had started, you know, in his late twenties, early thirties, he had started this and he had just, and it just kept going. And he's wow. like, I'm in my seventies. And I looked at him like, wait, 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 you're in your seventies. He did not look like he was in his seventies. I'm like, whatever you're doing, keep doing it's it. It's that project. You, it's exactly. the project. Yeah. yeah. And so it, it, it has to be. And so it's this amazing ongoing art project where the yard is littered with hand painted sculptures, you know, like he'll rescue, rescue a big boy. You know, the, I don't know if you are familiar with the, um, the, the big boy restaurant. So oh, yeah, Bob's. Big okay. Boy. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, like the, the little, that boy kind of carrying the burger on the plate and stuff. Well, he rescued one of those 
And he had that in there and he kind of like painted that up, you know, differently than what it normally is. And then there was a couple of Colonel Sanders in the, in the yard and they were like, you know, painted up. And then he, he had like all of like the hall of famers from the Green Bay Packers, uh, were painted as they were fire hydrants, but he painted them as, you know, the hall of famer. Um, and then he like, you know, has like his own artwork where he like welds and creates all of his own artwork or builds like all of these, like, you know, sculptures and stuff. And they're just like incredible, big, massive skull on the side of his house, like massive. We're talking about like six foot tall in the, but in the front, there's this fifties Chevy and it's half buried in the front yard. And we're not talking about a big house and we're not talking about a big yard, but he's got a full Chevy, like kind of like pitched and buried in this thing. And so we'll definitely be putting some links to my photographs on this one because it literally is something, you know, to be seen. It reminded so it was, me of when I went out to, I was down the Palm Springs area visiting my mom and dad and we went to the Salton Sea and there's mm -hmm. two artist camps out there. One's called Salvation Mountain and one's called East Jesus. And it's very Burning Man in that kind yeah. of art installation, sculpture, big, like larger than life artwork installations. And it's mm -hmm. just like when I saw your photos, I was immediately <laughs> reminded of yeah. of that experience that I'd had. And it's it's unusual because you don't see it very often. But, no, no, no. But it's it pretty great. incredible. And it was so funny is because he was so, so I'm, I get out. I'm like, I've got to get out and I've got to look at this. And my wife's like, not again. And so <laughs> she's like, you know, she, she's yeah. So she said, so she stayed in the truck while I'm, I'm out there. And then of course she like looks and realizes that I've been out there for like 20 minutes. And I just happened to, his garage was open, you know, he had a det detached garage and his garage was open. And I, and I saw a couple of hot rods in there and I just wanted mm -hmm. to like, kind of like glance there and he was standing there. And I was just like, I was like, excuse me, don't mean to bother you, but this is amazing. And, you know, he was just like, oh, thanks. And he came out and we just started talking. And, and I was like, I was like, how, how, how did, you know, like, what how drew you, get you to away doing with this? this? <laughs> it, well, it was funny enough is he was telling me a story about how one of his neighbors wanted to put up a fence and it ex exceeded the plot limits where he wanted to put the fence in the, they were like, you know, absolutely not. You can't put your fence there. And he was just, he was like yelling and screaming at the, I guess the zoning commission at the meeting, like this guy can put a Cadillac in his front yard, you know, bury a Cadillac in his front yard, but I can't put up a fence. He was just like, he was just like, he goes, he go, he go, cause I was asking him like, what do your neighbors think? I mean, like, you know, I mean, th to me, this is amazing. He's just like, other than that one guy with the fence, everybody else loves it because it brings people, you know, it kind of brings people to the neighborhood. How He's like, funny. he is the number one hit for people who actually drive to their neighborhood during Halloween, for Halloween, mm. to see his house. Mm. So I believe if you look up the hashtag, um, keep Cudahy, and it's C-U-D-H-A, oh, no, A-H-Y. Uh, we'll, we'll put it in the show notes. Um, but anyway, keep cut a hay fun. Um, and that kind of is the hashtag that. Okay. It's like that, keep Austin that goes, weird, keep Portland weird. Exactly. And right. his is in, but he had, and you would love this okay. as being a, a, you know, Petra head, like, like me is like, so he had, you know, a couple of different hot rods, like thirties era Fords that were some hot rods. And then he was telling me about this one hot rod that he had that he absolutely loved, but he had to get rid of it because he needed to make, you know, both he wanted a new project and he could, he went as far as he could with that project. So he sold it so that he could go out and buy this brand new hot rod that was like brand new. It was a, a sixties, it was, it was a sixties kind of like gasser, but it was just this amazing car that he's like restoring. And you know, he was fawning all over them and we were talking about that and he was just like, oh, come on. You know, it's like, we were walking around his little two car garage, you know, looking at like all of the memorabilia within the, you know, like the, the kind of like automobile themed memorabilia within his garage. And then all of like the art stuff, like out in his yards, like yards, backyard, side yard, front yard, the, oh, the only wow. three yards that he had completely filled with it. I don't, the one thing is, is that at least it keeps 
it from, you know, he doesn't have to do any more lawn mowing. Got to weed all the, you got to weed but the car to, in the yard. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah. So then we get down to where we were going, which is Racine. And we had the opportunity to sign up for two, two actual tours, docent led tours. And one was, and they were both for S.E. Johnson Foundation. And the S.E. Johnson Foundation, it, you know, obviously anybody who's a architecture nerd or architecture student that, you know, of Frank Lloyd Wright knows of the um, Johnson Wax Administration Building and also the lab building. And we got it. We had an opportunity to tour that. We also had an opportunity to tour H.F. Johnson's, which was the third generation of Johnson's running this, the Johnson, it, it actually is a, still a family run. There's like H.F. Johnson the third is running it now. Um, there, the, the house that Frank Lloyd Wright designed for H.F. Johnson was called Wing Spread. And it is amazing. It's, it's this pinwheel. Um, if you look mm -hmm. at the plan from above, it's a pinwheel. Mm -hmm. And it was intended to be a pinwheel to kind of show motion and, and stuff. And it absolutely does. But what was kind of amazing about it is, so we get to wing spread. We, we did wing spread first and then the um, administration building and the lab building second. And so we get to the, the house and I know we were early. I played it off that I didn't know that we were early. That I was like, oh, how dumb of me. I forgot to set my watch to central time zone. I'm still on Eastern. You know, my wife's like, you're an idiot. You know, it's just like, but I was just like, I was like, and we walked in and she's just like, can I help you? I was like, well, we're here for a tour, but I just realized that we were, that we're actually an hour early. And so we can go back and wait for our tour. Um, but I just, you know, wanted to kind of like, you know, check in. She's like, oh, no, no, no. How about this? The, the people, you know, who are here now for the, the 11 o'clock tour. So we were doing the 12 o'clock tour. They're, they're doing their self-guided tour. What we can do, you know, we can um, let you watch the 20 minute video. And then once that's done, you can do your self-guided tour, which is usually the last thing on the, on this, you have a, a block of an hour and it's usually the last thing that you do. And then you can go. And after the, after you do yourself, got a tour, then meet me back here. And then I could go through my, my spiel, which is about a 20 minute spiel on the history and, and a lot of other things that aren't really covered in the, in the video. Cause the video is actually done by Sam, I guess it would be SC Johnson, the second or third or whatever, but the mm -hmm. son of the, of the guy who had this house commissioned. And it was done by him. The video was done by him and his, his sister talking about, you know, growing up in wing spread. And, and so we, you know, we watched that. And so then we had the opportunity to basically go on this tour, uh, this walking, you know, the self guided walking tour. But what was amazing about that is because somebody played it off that they didn't know how to set their watch back. We had the entire house to ourselves. There was wow. not one single person. The docents were in their office. You know, because we still had like 40 minutes before the next one. We had yeah. 40 minutes to basically walk around this house and experience everything and tour and look and, oh, miss the, miss the part in her spiel where it says don't open things because <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I don't want to say anything because I'm never going to get invited <laughs> back to any of those things, but, yeah. <laughs> but, um. Uh, but I mean, it was, so it was, it was pretty amazing it, to, to be able to walk around there. And he has, so I guess back in, you know, the Kaufman house, Falling Water, you know, here, here he is, this is, you know, this guy who um, is a department store man, right? And in the department stores, they have basically all of the piped in music in the department stores. Um, there's this certain type of like turntable system that they have for those, for the department stores. It's, it's like a, a jukebox on steroids, but it's something very specific for, for department stores. Well, Johnson had one of those put into his house. And of mm -hmm. course it's, it's playing throughout this whole time. And it's so, cause you know, it's like playing, 
you know, like all of this fifties music, you know, like late forties, fifties kind of music and stuff. And it's just kind of like filtering through the whole, there was even some uh, green sleeves going on there. And, you know, it was just like this, it, it was just like filtering through. And so it was, like, it was just kind of like fun because the whole thing about this was, is that it was really built as, well, first of all, it was built for a blended family because this was his second wife and she had kids and, and then his kids. And so it was like, you know, to come together and kind of like, you know, have the center core of this house of so the center portion of that pinwheel was really about community and family. And so it was this big, massive volume and he didn't really want to have his, his son, his son loved to kind of like, you know, follow his dad when his dad was like, um, his dad was an avid pilot. And he used to kind of like basically buzz the house every time, like, you know, he was out flying. So the kid knew nice. when his dad was coming home. Well, so Frank Lloyd Wright built in. And so when you look at some of the photographs that I posted, you're going to see this kind of spiral staircase mm -hmm. and that spiral staircase went to the birdhouse type thing. And if you look at the exterior shots, you're going to see this like little glass kind of almost like a widow's walk type thing. But, you know, it was, it was, it was specially built for the son to be able to go up there and take a two-way radio with, you know, that his father had the other one in his airplane. And wow. so basically he would be able to like talk to his dad while his dad was like flying overhead. It was really kind of cool. That's incredible. You know? I, so, yeah. so my only experience with, and I'm super jealous that you got to go visit that place is because the first two like pieces of architecture that I was ever aware of in my entire life. So well, I was always interested in house plans and there was yeah. a few house plan books. I know we've talked about this before, like B Dalton bookseller in the mall or, you know, or yeah. it, I would go find these books and, and I will, I wanted to draw these floor plans because they were like nothing I had ever seen, you know, like a typical house plan book. is just, you know, a typical house plan book, but there was one yeah. of Frank Lloyd Wright's house plans and it was the Roby house and it was wing spread. Like those were the two <laughs> first houses yeah. that I was ever exposed to real architecture in and mm. i i still to this day have these vivid memories of those floor plans and so when you're talking about the pinwheel plan it's like yeah. i i can pull it right up and and i had to be i had to be like i don't know eight years old when i saw that yeah and so, so when you talk about the the spiral staircase that goes up, like that hearth that fireplace that all that stuff is just like it's seared in my memory forever. And and actually yeah. going to the Kaufman house, you know, going going to Falling Water mm -hmm. and seeing the the kettle that they have there. Yeah. Yeah. Re brought me right back to Wing Spread. Right. To and I don't exactly I don't know preserved. order wise which order which one came first, but I there it's a very similar idea for sure, if not design. Uh, so you know, that that's it's interesting. I, I'm gonna have to look at that because they do have a very similar kettle there too. So it was, so there is a shot that I don't think that I posted because I took so many. I mean, the good thing about being able to like walk around by yourself in there, I took tons and tons of photographs and I didn't yeah. have to wait for people to like, you know, get out of the yeah. way because nobody right. was in my way. Right. <laughs> I was, That's I was, awesome. I was the only person That's in my amazing. way. That's amazing. But he, he did on the second floor. So like right to this, to the side of where the spiral staircase is on the second floor, there's this vertical fireplace and it was intended to be where you basically, you took the logs and you stacked them vertically. And so when you let it on fire, you know, it has the spectacular flames and all this other stuff. Mm. And they're kind of like going up vertically. Boy, did he get that one wrong? Cause apparently he did not understand the properties of how things burn because uh -huh. apparently he said that the first time that they ever use it, they, they said that they like use it like once. Yeah. Because when it they form um, over function, right? they started falling out and there was like burning logs falling all over the place and they were just like Shooting freaking out. out into the living room. Exactly. It was not right. really designed the way it looks great. It looks fantastic. It does not, not perform. Yeah. It is not functional. You know, kind of like the sealant around every single window in that house. Cause they did tell another story of like, he was hosting some dignitaries and they were sitting at the dining room table in this big grand area. 
and it's got like all it's got this three levels of clear story above it and they're all kind of like you know slanted and in and whatnot and he's sitting there and it's raining outside and the the sun is looking at the dad the dad is looking at the sun like you know we know what's coming next and sure enough he's sitting there with his bald head and it's like drip and then it's pouring down his face drip <laughs> pouring down his face and he's sitting there with such a stoic look on his face of just like here i am with all these dignitaries and stuff and the 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 house is leaking on me and so they so just like without missing a beat he called to you know one of the servants and said you know bring me the phone brought the phone over and they basically said this was before you know like he had direct dial or something like that they said yeah, you know get me they said <laughs> give me frank lloyd wright in in scottsdale arizona because this was he was in you know talias and west at the time he's like get me on get me him on the phone right now he sat there and he waited and he said, sure enough, Frank Lloyd Wright picked up and he just like laid into it. It was just like the first, like one of the first clients that like just tore Frank a new one. And he was, it was basically complaining about the fact that, you know, like if they said, they, I think they said something like there's like 150 or 550, something like some obscene amount of windows in this house. Oh, wow. Every single one, every single one of them leaked. Oh my God. Now they don't, they, you know, because I will say this, like Turn what's out. kind of interesting about what's, what's exactly what's, what's interesting about Frank Lloyd Wright is that the ideas were way ahead of the technology to be able to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish the technology to, you know, for like waterproofing or reinforcing or whatever just didn't exist. Right. Not the way that right. he wanted to do it. There's like yeah. these super thin concrete planks, cantilevered concrete planks. Yeah. And they're, they're, it's just like, I wonder why they're sloping. It's just like, well, you know, it's because he wanted him super thin. It's just like thinking it, you know, about like all of the work that it went into restoring falling water. Like half of, if we had the technology, if he built it today off of the technology that we have today, it, it, we, we wouldn't have these issues. We would, There's we other wouldn't be compromises talking about. that would have to be made though. Yeah. yeah. It, it, well, <laughs> sure. So then fast forward to going to the C. Johnson. We always call it like the Johnson Wax building, right? I don't know if you ever call it like the Johnson Wax building. Yeah. So the Johnson Wax was, it's, it's not even the company name. It's just one of the products that they make was wax. Which one of the things that I didn't know is they actually started as a flooring company. A wood flooring company is oh, what wow. S.E. Johnson started with. It was S.E. Johnson and Sons wood flooring. But then they started making wood floor care products and that actually started to outsell the commissions for the wood floors and so they basically just switched to basically being a wood flooring product and then you know becoming you know what they are now with cleaners and all sorts of other things like you know you go into basically a little, little visitor center at the headquarters and they've got like all of the different products you know it's just like Drano and whatever else there so it's Almost everything, if you look in, you know, scrubbing bubbles, <laughs> Windex, whatever, it's all them. So, but it's, it's kind of cool. So then we get there and this was in a, in a way, somewhat disappointing of a tour for one reason. And this is, I will never understand this. And there's several Frank Lloyd Wright houses that this is the, the standard operating procedure. Um, I think falling water is one of them. You are not allowed to take, unless you pay for like another tour, but this one doesn't even offer, you know, any kind of tour. You're not allowed to take interior photographs. And I'm just like, I am here because I want to take pictures of the tulip columns, you know, these like mushroom headed column things and stuff like that in this whole space, this space that we know so much about from our picture books. Yeah. I want to take a picture of those. I don't There's want a picture book. I want a picture. There's already pictures and of those. Normally, you, you kind of like, so like they they have that same rule at the Glenstone. And I'm pretty sure if you guys follow my Instagram, you see some interior shots of the Glenstone. Yeah, because hmm. I That's will, weird. you know, like I I know where to stand and sneak pictures and things like that. Can't do that because 
There's a docent leading the pack and there is a security guard at the back. Following and I like yeah. usually fall into, I usually fall into the back so that I could sneak those pictures. Nah, dude was literally right behind me. I, I kept looking back at him and was just like, you're going to bust me if I try to take a picture, aren't you? And he's like, yeah. I was like, so would you like throw me out? It was, I was, I, I had him cracking up. I was, I, but I was just, so I was like, are you going to throw me out or are you just going to yell at me? You're just going to slap He's like, hand. well, you know, he's like, well, he is, you know, protocol is that we're supposed to like, you know, escort you out. I'm like, oh, cool. Then I can take a picture and then get thrown out. And, he's, and then he's just like, you know, he goes, let's not. I'm like, come on, let me take a picture. Okay, so um, what was it actually like? Okay, because we've all seen, I, I I hope everybody has seen the picture that you're talking about with the columns yeah. that go up and they 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 bloom out at the so, top. Oh, What's okay. it like to be in that space? So I will say this, and again to the link to the photographs that I took, you will be able to see a, a, a semi-obscured picture of it. I mean, you're still going to be able to see the columns and stuff, kind of like, off in the distance, kind of like through a lower vestibule and a low space, which was kind of like the bridge that kind of goes across. And then it kind of like opens up into this, you know, this massive double height space, um, actually triple height space. Yeah. So I was going to say it feels atrium, really tall. Yeah. Yeah. Atrium that doesn't have a you know, smoke evac system. Again, <laughs> something that he wouldn't be able to do today because like all of these offices and stuff open up into the atrium. And the only way for you to like get around the code are some like little tricks that I learned to be able to get around them, but to also to avoid having a smoky access. But anyway, it was an amazing, it was, the space was amazing. The only thing that would like gives me pause on the space is, okay, he also designed all of the furniture too, because mm -hmm. that's what he does. You know, they had those seats in the in the lobby of the visitor center you know where you check in and we went and we sat down the very my wife sat down first and then i sat down like right after her and she was just like oh damn this is uncomfortable you know <laughs> you're just like yeah and so it was that was not his sitting. concern apparently though so these chairs they're round chairs with a round back that kind of like rotates but doesn't lean back or anything like I am sitting in an Aeron chair right now mm -hmm. and they were just like, he had designed these chairs and it had three wheels on it. And if you, and it was intended to be because Frank believed in perfect posture. And so you, if you sat in it perfectly, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't fall, fall over. over. <laughs> but because the chairs were so uncomfortable, they yeah. called them the screamer chairs because throughout the day you would hear somebody scream as they're falling over. I was just like, come on, this is how fun I mean, is that? Exactly. That's there was so like fun. these the, and so again, HF Johnson calls up Frank and says, I am having too many people fall over in these chairs. What are you gonna do about it? He's like, make them sit properly. Ooh, that was his wow. answer to them. He's like, No, 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 no. You're going to fix this. And so he ultimately ended up designing a four wheel one that and the reason, and the reason why he designed the four wheel one is he had, he actually had Frank come back to the headquarters and he sat him in one of those three wheel chairs. Cause he was just like, you know, I, I've never fallen over in these chairs. You, you, you know, they're just not sitting in these chairs properly. They said that he had, he had, posi he had positioned a pencil at the edge of the table and strategically knocked that, the pencil off the ground. And said, "Hey, could you hand me that pencil?" And when Frank leaned over to to grab the pencil, he fell. Out. He, fell out, he went toppling over. And I was just like, "Oh, clever. that's so great!" And so that's they were like, clever. "You know, if if you were in this situation, what would you do?" And I like you hear from the background. I call Herman Miller and get a bunch of air on chairs, and then you <laughs> and then you automatically knew where the architects were in the on the tour because they all were snickering. And then there was, of course, like uh, people were like, "I don't get what he's saying." But you could tell the the architects were just like, yep, yep, I would too. I, and it, I've it was, owned an Aeron chair for like 20 years. And man, that chair is a tank. That is a super tank. It's a tanker. 
I love it. You know, I mean, I've got lower back issues and all of this other stuff, but when I sit in this one all day long, it's comfortable. And, life of an you know, architect. <laughs> life of an architect. Yeah. <laughs> sitting in a chair so, all day long. So I wasn't able to get any photographs of the actual building itself, but it was, it's, it's a pretty amazing space. But so they had, they did have to install carpet because apparently they called the floors clackers because all day long, you know, like the whole, the, I, the I whole, everything they, had, name. they had you all these like nicknames and clackers. Yeah. You know, they had like all of these like nicknames for like all the different like issues that they had to like work around this building That's because- amazing. Like it, the, this was, you know, back in the day when, you know, the whole thing was the secretarial pool and, and things like that. So it was all women working in here and they were all in high heels and he basically like all day right. long. All day long. And they yeah. said it was just drove people crazy. And, um, but the desks were kind of like these amazing, like Frank Lloyd Wright desks that were just like really, really cool looking desks. Not necessarily comfortably functional when you were, you know, they had like these rounded, like slide out, not slide, not like a slider. Like, you know, you, you here, I'm going to like do a little thing. Like you pull straight out. No, these like swung out mm -hmm. and he's just like, oh, so you could, he goes, I did it that way so that you could be able to get to like the back of the, you know, like instead of like having to like reach to the back of the, the desk you know, the back of the drawer, I'm, you know, you can see everything in the drawer. I was like, the problem is, is that because it's rounded, you can't put anything in, you can't put paper in there. <laughs> he, he literally, he designed, so he designed. That's hilarious. The paper that they wrote on to be small enough. So it wasn't eight and a half by 11. It was oh smaller than that. So that it could fit into his desk that he oh. had properly designed. It was, it was so, it was like, eh, well, you know, I mean, much? He, Exactly. Right. And so, so then we go into the, what anybody today would call. So we go into the lab building and what every lab designer or any architect would call is just a folly of OSHA violations. <laughs> Amazing. So let me, let me get this out of the way amazingly beautiful design art art modern right you know not necessarily known for him being known for that but a beautifully executed art modern building that honestly was probably better than anybody else's period like it was it's an amazing building wow the so all of you know it's got the center core structure these floor plates so like every other floor plate is a round disc and then there's, so it's round and square, round and square, round and square. So when you look at the building, because of the types of windows that he used for it, which were basically Pyrex tubes that bent in the curve and then just stacked together, which do not keep you warm or cool throughout the right. year. It's an absolute <laughs> right. disaster of a type, but still amazing as hell. You can see the sh you you can see the impression of the the intermediate floors, kind of like hovering back yeah. and right. and then you see when you see the light kind of like coming through it, it just kind of gives you that silhouette of this mm. curvaceous kind of like silhouette from the interior. It's so like you look at it and you're Incredible. like, damn, that's so cool. But then me looking at it, it's just like you can't like you look at like the fume hoods. You look at the way that you know like. <laughs> all of the, like all of like these open flames and everything else. And all of like the way the labs are that we design labs to now, cause I'm doing a lab right now versus the labs that he designed. They were both functional and aesthetic. You know, we usually design things more for function, not aesthetic, of course. Yeah. but they were, these were just, they were badass. They were, what year was this? Um, it was in the thirties. So, so almost a hundred years ago. Like, yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, to put it into context, that's, that's pretty crazy that it like aesthetically yeah. still makes an impact on you. 90 oh yeah. Years, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and 
of course it's not going to measure up to today's standards in as far as functionality uh, osha you know, you know code all those things but it's just like that got built like that's a real thing that you can go yeah. visit and take a tour of and it's wow. an occupiable usable sculpture because i mean at the, there there's no way that you can't call that sculptural as much as a functional building you know, what's interesting about the way that I look at the building. So like, you know, then you, you know, stop criticizing and say, like, oh, you'd never be able to do this today kind of thing. Forget that. Again, put that aside. And you look at what he was doing at that time when oh. nobody else was doing that. There oh, was, was no, yeah. this was essentially insulated glass without them being an insulated glass. Now, was it a successful insulated glass? No, it wasn't. Here we were, it was a maybe 70 degree day. It was nice and nice, cool breeze outside. We go inside the building. We're sweating. Everybody's sweating. It was the stack effect that was going on and everything else. It was just, it wasn't, it wasn't comfortable, but it was amazing. It was still amazing though. You know, the thing about it is that there's one stair, one stair for this entire tower. There's one elevator, one stair. There's really, really kind of like cool, but weird bathrooms, like in the stair, you know, like. So you go into the stairwell and the, so there's the stairwell and the bathrooms all in the same space. Mm. And it's just like, you definitely can't do that today. You know, there's like Weird. so many codes that, you know, against all of that, but it's, but they were so, and because everything was rounded, the bathroom door was this rounded metal door that was on, you know, basically kind of like a barn door type thing. Mm. Like on a top like track, a track that yeah. rolled with it. But it wasn't like a an accordion door or anything. It was a a, a solid door that was just round and it would just like roll and That's roll. Cool. It was just like I was like, "That's just cool." Like it, it reminds me of uh, I went to the Sheets Goldstein residence by John Lautner in L.A., which is like <laughs> one of the really famous houses that he did. Yes, right? and and um, there's this glass curtain wall that is no mullions at all between the living room and like this outdoor deck that's right in front of a pool. So there's there's a roof that shoots over the whole thing, which is kind of a lot in our thing, right? It was like this right. big roof over a series of spaces. And the roof was always like the, the major form. And then the, the spaces were kind of worked out by furniture, low partition walls, change in elevation, things like that on the interior of the houses. There's glass there. Somebody walked right into the glass, right? Because it's <laughs> like, it feels like one big space, indoor and outdoor space. It just feels right. like a big space. And what was interesting was to find out from the docent that that, was, that glass was not in the original design. There was an air <laughs> curtain. So John Lautner used a lot of, like, quote-unquote, advanced technologies in yep. his designs where he would design these technologies to fit the architecture, which is kind of like what you're talking about with Frank Lloyd Wright, right? Well, it was like... It was very ahead of its time because there was nothing on the market that actually did what he wanted it to do. And so you've it, named. Well, in L.A., there's this air curtain, and it was like it never gets cold in L.A. Like, that was the idea, right? And it was uh -huh. like, no, it gets yeah. freezing cold in L.A. in the wintertime yeah, exactly. for people who live in L.A., at least. Maybe if, exactly. you, don't, if you live in the Midwest, it's a little, a little different uh, of a standard. But it was like... The air curtain didn't work, and and they went back in and they put in frameless glass at some hmm. point. But what's interesting to me is like they address the issue, and what you're right. talking about is like these advancements have been made and they have yeah. kept it how it was. Yeah. So it's kind of this yeah. time capsule of of a project. It's funny as I was thinking about, it's like could you go in and retrofit, not really change the overall design, but retrofit it, to, you know, like to be you know, maybe more high performance or something. And yeah, you could basically come in, you know, with like glass behind it or something like that, that, you know, kind of like creates like a triple pane window or something like that. But you wouldn't want to mess with it I mean, because there was, there was such a, a simplicity to it. So it's funny is like, so both of the houses, both of the architects that you had mentioned, Schindler and Lautner, what do they have in common? They were both, <laughs> they were both, they were both apprentices to Frank Lloyd Wright. Yeah. And wing spread, that big, massive cantilever was something that helped launch Lautner's career mm. because he was the one who actually made a uh, big, huge cantilever work when he yeah. was working for Frank Lloyd Wright. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I, 
somebody had told me that. And before I kind of like went and started to repeat it, I actually did a little bit of research to make sure that was in fact true. And it was in fact true. Uh-huh. And what was interesting about, so then I started reading more and more about Lautner and Lautner's kind of like very intentional career when he went out on his own was, is that he had learned a lot and he, and he, you read stories about him and he will attribute to almost all of his knowledge to Frank Lloyd Wright, to, to Mr. Wright. He will continue to call him Mr. Wright. You know, people who worked for him, they called him Mr. Wright. And so he will always attribute everything that he knew to that. But he wanted to distinguish himself from being just an apprentice of Frank Lloyd Wright. And so all of his buildings are purposely designed to not embody any of the things, any of the style that he learned and that he was drawing and detailing for Frank Lloyd Wright. None of that kind of like leached into his work. There's a lot of other apprentices, Alden B. Dow, um, Bruce Goff, yeah, all of these other ones clean. that still yeah. have that that have a lot of like right to them, even though they still have their own character. They still have right as kind of like as an embodiment of those of like the moves that they did. Right. Him. He he purposely and it was you have to applaud it because the way that he did it though, it wasn't like he was thumbing his nose at Frank and saying Psh, I'm going to do it my way. He held him in very high regard, but he was just like, I got my style too, dude. And yeah. his, and I know you love him. And, you know, we got a book like literally sitting right behind me of, you know, the, the Tashin uh, Lautner book. I, you know, had been flipping through that. I, I don't think that I actually ever bought them to read them, but I've been reading them because of everybody's connection to, it's so funny. It's like Schindler. Neutra, I mean, one of my favorites, right. Neutra, all these different people who have connections to write, you know, but we don't normally connect them to it. And reading this, this book that I was telling you about that I do suggest people read, even get the audio book. Cause it's, it's actually a really good storytelling that you can kind of keep in the background, but how Neutra left, right. He, there was one point in time where they actually were cordial to each other and, you know, like and then I guess there was some point that they became arch enemies and it was wow. just like, you know, they, yeah. there was just like, they, they, you know, both went to the grave hating each other. Architecture like, games. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like games. <laughs> yeah. In, in the thing was, it what was it? The, his, the, his Kaufman house, um, in you know, Springs. he, yeah. it, I think that was the breaking point, but he rev- Frank actually said that he, he loved that house, but I think that was, um, the, I, I got to do a little bit more reading, but I, I think that was actually the breaking point because he felt betrayed by the client that he went with somebody else. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh man. Well, but, I'm yeah, super I was, jealous of your, your tours that you got to do. That's and, so cool. And that was only two buildings of so many other buildings on the Frank Lloyd Wright trail. If anybody is in Wisconsin, do yourself a favor. And if, you know, aficionado of architecture, do yourself a favor and one, download the, the Frank Lloyd Wright trail app, because it, it kind of like tells you some stories and stuff. And, you know, you've got places that you can post photographs on and you can check in and just kind of like little tick off of, you know, How cool. um, that you've been there, but it's like my national it, parks, uh, book yeah, that, yeah, I yeah, have yeah. that I have that I can go get stamped off every, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. To. Or, or if you have the <laughs> national park app, you can also do the you can like click that you've been there hmm, right. and stuff. So that's, so they have, that and it's, it's, Lloyd it's kind of, status. and they've got, and they've got the Frank Lloyd Wright trail that they do that too. But the thing is, is that you just stumble onto so many, there's so many private residences that aren't on the Frank Lloyd Wright trail that if you just do a little bit of research, we started like defaulting to Googling. It's just like Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright buildings near me. Yeah. And they would be like this house or this house or this house. And they're all still private residences and you of yeah. course can't go and tour them, right. but they're peek um, up over the fence. Yeah. You can, you can peek up over the <laughs> fence. One of his largest prairie style houses, I think last prairie house, or did they, do they consider it Eus- Usonian? I can't, I'm going to have to go back and look now, but anyway, so, um, Johnson, <laughs> let me, let me do one last story about the, the Johnson wing spread house. So, I told you that it was built for his second wife and kind of their blended family. And before Wingspread was 
finished, his second wife passed away. And so her kids never lived in the house and his kids did. So they grew up there, you know, they moved to the house and they, you know, were growing up there. And so then he remarried and this was a Hollywood actress and she was kind of like, you know, she was the, the ruler of the roost and all of this other stuff. And so she had, had moved in and they had really hadn't been there that long. And they were hosting, apparently Frank was known to like, kind of like drop in on people, stay his former clients his and all this houses. other stuff and, <laughs> and stay in his house. So this is not their, they're, they're stewards of his stuff. And so he was there and so he was staying there and they had made some food and they were like using like, you know, sitting in chairs that, you know, were not his because he had designed the, the chairs for him. And there was furniture that was not his. <laughs> and they were all in other chairs. And they were all in storage on the grounds. So in the middle of the night, you, you know where the story is going? In the middle of the oh night, Frank Lloyd Wright went into the storage and took all of her furniture out of the house. He put all of his furniture back in the house. And so there's like this perch, you know, that you overlook mm-hmm. the, the big main area. And she's coming like out of the kitchen and she, like she's seeing all of this and it's like, what's going on? And he's standing there kind of like, you know, chest puffed up, you know, like, and then he was just like, isn't this better? <laughs> and she was just like, Mr. Wright, I want you to leave my house right now. Just go pack your stuff and get out and kicked him out. And then they commissioned another architect to build another house on the site. Like basically just, just a little bit up the hill. So if you go outside, you see the actual, the, the other house that they had built and they moved out and grew up and moved into that house because of spite, Uh, just she, to spite him, she did that. And then they turned the, um, wing spread is actually still to this day, a functioning, functioning conference center where they had actually, uh, world leaders came together and had some of the things that had happened there is the EPA was established there. The world bank was established there. Um, and all sorts of different things were, were discussed at wing spread. So not only is wing spread, you know, this kind of like have this really interesting story about Frank Lloyd Wright in architecture and the client and things like that. But then it also has this connection to so many different world events that happened. Wow. So it's, 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 it was pretty amazing. Kind of a significant thing. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's so. Cool. All right. I'm going to have to go back to that, the trail. You need to come out here and we can hit the trail together. I think, yeah, I think a tour is in order, man. This is going to be a, yeah. I mean, we, yeah. we, we, we did a little tiny bit of it when we were in Chicago. Right. Right. That just yeah. kind of like wet the appetite or the. Oh, uh, yeah. 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 There's yeah. just some. So, we gotta, a, a huge concentration and, of, of work to see out there. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. All right, man. Well, well till next time. Chat, chat with you soon.